You know, I think about it, there, there are some lessons in life that you learn right away. Mm. Oh. You make a mistake or you fail, or you even touch the, per se, the, the iron that wall is hot, and you're like, okay, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. You learn it right away. But there's other lessons in life that it seems like it can take us forever to learn. Mm. You know, the Bible says that suffering, when fully matured, produces hope. And yet, we kind of get there, we're like, man, I'm just stuck in suffering. I don't actually get to the next level of life. You know, there's some things I think even as a man, there are some lessons you have to learn, or you're just, it's a survival issue. Yeah. I think about it, when a woman asks you what you want to eat, mm -hmm. the lesson is not you figuring out what you want to eat, mm -hmm. you have to decode what she wants. Yep. That's the real lesson you have to learn. It's the only way you're going to be able to survive. You have to learn as well as most men, uh, I think a lot of people in this church, the, the younger men, uh, li like to play video games. What does FPS mean? Yep. No, it doesn't. It means food, prayer, and sleep. <laughs> that, that, whenever a woman is going through something, you it's better to have food, prayer, and sleep than to ask her, hey, is everything okay? you got to learn that lesson. That doesn't usually work. And then the last lesson we all have to learn is how to carry about 10 grocery bags from the car to home. Because you're not a man if you have to make two trips, right? That's just, oh. That doesn't work. <laughs> you, know, you think about it. When's the, when's the time in your life it took you a long time to actually learn that lesson? I, I always kind of remember my niece. Uh, we, she always loved watching Finding Nemo as a child. And uh, every single time we would be babysitting her, we just know, okay, we just put on Finding Nemo, we'll just kind of, the next two and a half hours are killed. I don't know how long that movie goes for. But um, every single time that we'd be watching it, we sit on the couch and we're just watching the TV, and you can just see my little niece just kind of creeping in front of me, and just stands right in front of me and watches the TV. And every single time, no, get out of the way! She kind of runs away, she gets scared and everything. But lo and behold, two minutes later, she gets right, she, I don't know what's with her, but she just kind of always stood right in front of me, in front of the TV, and I was like, she actually never learned her lesson here. You know, and I think about it, even in the church, why do you think we always talk about faith? Why is that something we continuously talk about? I think it is because it is a lesson we're going to have to be retaught over and over until we just get it. But take some comfort. Jesus' disciples were exactly the same. And today we're simply going to look at and understand that the rate at which you learn is the rate at which you grow. Mm -hmm. And the main question we just have to ask ourselves is the title of my lesson today is how long will it take you? Mm -hmm. How long will it take you to learn the lessons in your life? Well, point number one, how many miracles do you need? Mm. See, I believe Jesus, he probably wished many times throughout his ministry that he could just tell his disciples one thing once. They would understand it, comprehend it, fully go on in motion. But that's actually not what usually happens in his ministry. I mean, even looking at the Old Testament, how many times did God have to call the Israelites to repentance? Like millions of times. All the time, they kind of got it, they had to go back, got it, got, had to go back, always called to repentance. We see that God was dedicated to teaching through reputation, no matter how long it took. And we understand this in the following scripture. In Romans 2, 4, it says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not, really, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It talks about here in God's character that, yes, he's going to show you patience in abundance, but it is the purpose to lead us to repentance, to a permanent change in our life. And it talks about, hey, do, we cannot show contempt when we hear that God's going to give us another chance. Instead, it must get us to rely on or at least uh, focus on the repentance in our life. So we're just going to look at a story where God is giving the, uh, the, his disciples, showing them another lesson that he wished that they would have already learned. But he's just going to have to teach them over and over again. In Mark 8, verses 1 through 9. It says, During those days, another large crowd gathered. So you hear already, another large crowd, another one's coming around. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home uh, hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? 
How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked? Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. They did so. They had a few fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of bread, uh, broken pieces, that were left over. You know, we read this story, and some people might be thinking, oh, well, I've already heard the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. But we realize that that's actually not this story. Jesus feeding the 5,000 was a couple chapters before. This isn't just going again. This isn't Jesus feeding the 4,000. And yet, the disciples have already forgotten the miracles that God can produce. We look here, how long did it take them to forget? Two chapters. It took them two chapters to forget God's miracles and his ability to do things. And it gets us thinking, well, how have we forgotten the obstacles God has helped us to get here as well? How quickly do we forget the miracles that God's produced? I think about for those that have um, brave, uh, courageously come here on the mission team. Hey, when you were back in Sydney, this group was actually the most fruitful group back in Sydney. Yeah. Last year, you guys had the most baptisms last year. Do we forget these things? Do we forget how quickly God answered our prayers for getting jobs? And how amazing those prayers were answered. For me, I think about what's actually happened this year. It's so easy just to forget the miracles. When's the last time I talked about my cousin getting baptized? Yeah. That was awesome. About us getting an apartment. I know that was something that we were looking forever to get. Us getting our car. My best friend getting restored. Carl. Love that guy. Pascal getting baptized. Like, th these are awesome miracles. When's the last time I even talked about these things? And I think about why do we forget so easily the miracles that we pray for? Maybe we can suggest a couple different reasons why the disciples here forgot. I think one, they didn't recognize that the miracle came from God. They may have thought, man, it was just a luck of the draw. You know, it, it can never happen again. This wasn't God, it was just it was just luck. In this possibility, they haven't even possibly even forgot about it. They probably didn't even recognize a miracle in their life. You know, think about what are some miracles in your life that you just fail to recognize? There are some lessons that we don't learn because we think it's just an exception. Oh, that wasn't really a miracle. It was just an exception. You know, we had the baptisms earlier this year. Man, that was just an exception. You don't understand things have changed now. We, we forget the miracles. I think they didn't remember it because they weren't the ones who performed it. You know, when you perform a miracle, maybe you, you remember it. Wow, I did this. This is awesome. God worked through me. But it's kind of easy to forget what someone else did. And kind of lower the credibility of God's God working through you and God working through the church. Because he's not working personally with you at that moment. So it can be kind of easy to forget. I think about it, even when I preach a sermon. I know each one of my points. I know my examples, everything. You guys forget next week. Like, I, I know it for sure, 100%. But it's, it's kind of like that. We, we, if it doesn't happen to us or we weren't in the making, we kind of forget it. Like, well, no, that's not much of a miracle. You know, do you fail to see God? Because you are too preoccupied about worrying how everyone sees you. Well, what, what if everyone, yeah, God's doing miracles, but it doesn't feel like I'm the one doing it. So what if people think God's not working through me anymore? We forget. We start to take it too personal. Even that, I could have felt that with my cousin. That my cousin getting baptized is a miracle, period. <coughs> but I wanted to be part of that a little bit, right? I wish I could have studied the Bible with my cousin. I wish I could study the Bible with my family. They're back in Los Angeles. But it's, it's awesome to still hear that God is working through my family. But we, we can forget that, though. I think one other fact as well is why we can forget miracles is the old miracle might be hidden behind a new problem. That sometimes we, we have old, great miracles, but now they're hidden behind new problems in our life. See, the problem was the same one that they faced before, but they didn't matter to the heart. See, they had the same problem previously when Jesus fed the 5,000. We actually read here in Mark 6, 51 through 52, it says, Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. 
They were completely amazed, for they had not understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Like I said, all these other things could have might have added to them forgetting about the miracle, but it says here that why didn't they understand what was going on? It's because their hearts were hardened. Despite being with Jesus, witnessing the miracles, and hearing the extra lectures after everybody else left, the disciples got the extra little tutoring, they still didn't understand. Why? Because their hearts were hard. That, that's quite easy when you harden your heart. You just don't want to understand. You don't want to accept what God's trying to teach you. Have, has uh, some people may know here, has anybody ever been discipled by Joe before? Or been challenged by that? Okay, just, I just wanted to get on common ground. Um, if you guys don't know who Joe is, he's, he's one of our leaders back in Sydney. And uh, he's an amazing leader. I'm grateful to have him in my life. But I remember that there was one time where I, I just had a hard heart. There was something that he was trying to teach me that just wasn't sinking in about maybe a year ago or two years ago. Um, when you become a leader in any way, you have to kind of unlearn fending for yourself and realize that it's, it's all about everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's not about just what you do, but everyone else. And so came time in the church where special was happening. Now, for those that don't know what kind of special contribution is, it's when the church um, kind of collects a large amount of money to help send out mission teams. Us being included, Auckland, we kind of uh, came out here from people raising up special from Los Angeles, from all these other places. So that's what's awesome about being a worldwide movement, yeah. is that we're, we're a worldwide fellowship in that way. So anyway, special was coming. I was kind of looking over a group up in the north region in, in uh, Sydney. And for myself, I personally made my special. I felt good about it. It was awesome. It was great. But not many of my group made their special. They didn't actually hit the goal that they wanted to reach. And so Joe came, Joe came to me, and I thought I was going to get a pat on the back. Like, man, you did it. That's awesome. Instead, I walk into this rebuke. And he slaps me across the face almost with a word, just like, you failed. And I, I kind of had a heart. I was like, the heck I did. I made my special. These guys failed. I didn't fail. They failed. And I kind of walked away really changed because I thought a little bit different. I was like, wow. You know, I was thinking about Joe, and I was like, wow, man. He can be completely wrong sometimes. <laughs> That's how my heart was. I was thinking, Leah, you trying to convince me of all these things? So he's just completely wrong. I walked away feeling good about myself. I made my special. That's their fault. And so obviously our next conversation went as well as you thought it would go. Um, but the real reason I didn't learn from this, because I just had a hard heart. I didn't want to accept the, the real stinging truth is that I failed. That's a hard thing to accept. And so therefore, I didn't want to learn my lesson. But thank God I did. See, these disciples, they had a hard heart as well. They didn't want to accept that it was still their responsibility to take care of the people. They still had it on their hearts. God, yeah, you, 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 you uh, fed them last time, but that's not our job anymore. Really? Is it? No, I promise we'll send them out this time. It'll be okay. See, we never see their reaction of having to pass out all the bread and the fish. Man, that took a long time. 4,000 people? That they're the ones that had to pa pass it all out? Then we come to find that having and producing miracles is hard work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes hard work makes a hard heart. Yeah. And that's, what, and that's probably what they had at the end of it. Is they didn't care about the miracle anymore. They just thought about, man, it was so hard to produce this miracle. But because of their hard heart, they missed the miracle of God and his power. If it wasn't for Jesus, everyone else there would have left home missing his power as well. They still see, didn't see that God was willing to take care of his people. And it was their mission to do so as well. Read here in Matthew 19, 26. Is, Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. See, when it comes to miracles, God is never challenging us or pushing us that we need to go and produce the miracles. It's never about that. He simply wants us to bring opportunities to him to produce it for, for us. We don't produce the miracles. God does. So we just have to simply bring it to him. And the only way to do this is to have faith. But it's hard to have faith when you have a hard heart. Because you don't see the potential of miracles anymore. You just see the risk of misery. Like, I don't know if this is a miracle. Maybe something wrong or bad is going to happen. 
It's kind of like when you're in a relationship and you're mad at the other person, so you don't expect them to do things nice for you. You just expect them to treat you how you're treating them, right? So if I'm mad at my wife, I don't expect her to kind of feed me dinner and everything. I, I expect her to get mad at me, right? It's the same thing. When we have low faith in God, we think God has low faith in us. When we think God can't produce a miracle, he thinks, oh, well, I'm not going to use you anymore. That's not how it works. God is a God of miracles. He wants to produce miracles anytime. Why? Because that's his character. So we have to go back into our lives and going back to this point is, how many miracles is it going to take you to remember? To actually decide to have faith. How, did, how many miracles is it going to take in your life before you soften your heart towards God? Before you stop complaining about how things can't happen in your life because there's no earthly way for it to be possible and start to see things that God can do through you. Whether that's more baptisms in the church, whether that's your personal repentance, your faith, whatever is going on in your life, how many more miracles do you need? Jesus did the same too. He's like, guys, you just need to soften your hearts. You know, my challenge in my first point is I want you to write down all the miracles God has done in your life. I want you to remember what God is doing. Don't wait for the next one. Remember all the ones that he's doing in the past and that he can kind of pro project you to do in the future as well. Point number two, how many signs do you need? Come on, Sean. Matthew 15, if you're turning in your Bibles. We're going to read at the end, verse 39, all the way to chapter 16, verse 4. So Matthew 15, 39, through chapter 16, verse 4. After Jesus sent the crowd away, he got into a boat and went to the vicinity of Magdalene. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair, fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the time. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for signs, but none will be given to them except the sign of Jonah. Here we see Jesus traveling back to the sea, uh, on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, giving them another opportunity to kind of get that more personal teaching in their time. Um, though they had, we kind of looked through their relationship, though the disciples and Jesus, you know, they had their interactions, the disciples still had a hard heart. What we never see, though, is that them telling to Jesus to prove himself. Throughout the disciples, they never asked for a sign. They never ask for miracles. They don't ask anything. Maybe they don't understand, but they still don't get him to prove this stuff. They never ask for a sign. And yet we see here that the Sadducees and the Pharisees, on the other hand, find it necessary to question and to test Jesus. They say, hey, show us a sign from heaven. Jesus turns around and accuses them of two things. First, being wicked and adulterous. I was thinking, okay, I kind of understand wicked maybe a little bit because they're, they're questioning God, but why adulterous? I think because God saw this as being unfaithful to him. Yeah. It's kind of like when there's a relationship, usually the unfaithful partner is the one that's questioning the relationship. Well, does he still love me? Well, does this, does this, right? They're the ones unfaithful, yet they're questioning what's going on. It's kind of the same thing. When you start doubting in the relationship, that, that, that's, that's, that's you. you got to take that on your heart. So Jesus calls them adulterous and wicked. And what do these things mean? Well, simply, uh, these were the roots of their lack of, uh, of belief. Heart sins that stopped them from seeing who God really was. And we can do that a lot too. Ask for signs. How many of us ask for signs, right? There's something on our heart that we know we should be doing, but we still ask for signs. We say, well, hey, man, should, should I still keep coming to church? God, give me a sign why I should come to church. God, should I be more dedicated? God, should I get baptized? God, should, should I be giving special? Should I go into the ministry? God, give me a sign. We're asking for signs even for things that we already know we should be doing. Because right. they're subjective and they're usually prone to us seeing signs that align with things that we already want to do. You know, it's funny. I remember hearing this sister. She was like, man. I started to see these posters of this movie everywhere. It was on the bus and it was on, over here and everything. And I just felt like, 
God was calling me to go watch this movie. And then we had to talk to the sister. No, that's advertising. <laughs> that, that's, not, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's, that's advertisement. You know, that's a commercial. In the same way, sometimes we do that. God, you know, if, if only that there was donuts. Like, oh, oh okay. You know, like already. That, you, you, you ask for signs for things that you already want to do. Instead, it's not looking for signs, but it's looking for the word. Right. God, what do you call me to do? So he says, he replies to them, hey, only the sign of Jonah will be given to you. Well, what's the sign of Jonah? Well, just understanding that he's just making somewhat of a comparison from the Pharisees to the people of Nineveh. So Jesus was paralleling the Pharisees and the Sadducees with the people of Nineveh in the book of Jonah. Now, if you haven't read the book of Jonah, you might be familiar with it with the man who got swallowed up by the big whale or the fish. That would kind of make more sense according to the text and thrown up three days later. That's, that's the book of Jonah. And pretty much Jonah was called to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. And what Jesus is saying here is the people of Nineveh that Jonah preached to actually repented of their evil ways by the end of that book. Um, after hearing Jonah's call for repentance, he didn't do any miracles really there. While the Pharisees continued in their unbelief, despite being eyewitnesses to the, uh, to the miracles of Jesus. So he's saying here, he's like, telling the Pharisees that they were guilty of the sin and the sin of unbelief. Given that the conversion of the people of Nineveh, where they had far less miracles, far less signs, far less evidence, and yet they repented simply because they knew it was the right thing to do. He's telling them, you don't need any more signs. Yeah. You know what you need to do. Just simply go and do it. You know, there are so many things that we just have to ask ourselves. You know, what, what are we waiting for? What, what sign are we waiting for? We've heard the words of God. We've seen the miracles. We've seen how God's interacting in our lives. Yeah. But we're still waiting. Mainly why? Because repentance can be hard. Change can be hard. I don't know. But it's just asking yourself, how many more scriptures do you need to do the right thing? Mm -hmm. To stop struggling in your faith. How many more scriptures do you need? How many more people do you need to hurt to change your sin? Mm -hmm. How many more purposeless lives, uh, excuse me, purposeless years do you have to waste in your life to realize, hey, I just need a change now. I don't need another story. I just need to do it. You know, why are we waiting to do good and the godly? You know, this week is going to be no different than next week. Time is not going to change these things. It just goes back down to the decision. Mm. And I think that's something I had to ask myself as I went away for the past couple days. And I was just thinking about how do I feel about this year um, as a church? And I mean, I feel awesome. And I feel good. But I got to a point where I was like, there's something in my heart where I don't have a holy anger in our fruitlessness. Like, I, I didn't reach that part in my heart yet. And I was just asking myself, is it going to take another month of no baptisms and then I'm going to get mad? Is it going to take another couple people that don't make it? I'm like, what's going to get me to the point where I'm just begging God for it? Because to be honest, I, I haven't really begged. I kind of just went along. Hopefully it's going to come. And that's when I started getting in my heart. I was like, how, how long is it going to be? I just need to make that decision today and go after it. Go after these decisions. I don't need another sign. We just need to go for it. Come on, Sean. See, our expectation of the speed of repentance should be the same as before baptism as it is after. Mm -hmm. We don't need to wait for anything else. We simply need to go and make those decisions. So my challenge here is what are you waiting for? Write down one thing that you are waiting for to do. And just write down a list. What exactly are you waiting for? What, do you need another scripture? Do you need another prayer? Well, we'll do that today. Make that decision. See, in conclusion, Jesus had to keep teaching his disciples over and over that he was a man that could do the miracles. They had nothing to worry about. But yet, still by the end of it, they still weren't getting it. In Mark 8, kind of in conclusion, verse 13 through 21, we get near the end of, of Jesus' lesson here. It says, then they left him and got back into the boat and crossed over to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring the bread, except for one loaf that they had with them in the bread. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? 
Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have ears but fail to see? Uh, excuse me, eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves of the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when you broke the twelve, uh, the seven loaves of the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? See, after his um, interaction with the hard-hearted Jews, Jesus is off again with his disciples in the boat for more specific discipling. And how, to, um, and how to teach them again and again of the miracles that he can do. And this in turn, you know, shows us that we have to continue to learn these lessons until we make that decision to do it. Like the disciples, though, there are going to be this, that lessons in our lives that are going to take us some time. But there are other lessons that it doesn't need to. It just needs that decision. Yeah. See, when they came to realize the truth about Jesus, that they went on to go and change the world. That all it took was them getting to that point that Jesus was the money maker. You know, Jesus was the guy. Jesus was the, the miracle maker. Once they got to that point, everything changed. They went to change the world. And guess what? We are called to the same impact. Yeah. The only question left to answer, though, is how long is it going to take you? Thank you very much.